today I wanted to start off with a uh, few slides on some problems for the future that your generation is going to have to figure out how to solve. Uh, and uh, I'm going to be faced with figuring out how to pay for it. Um, and then I wanted to move on to uh, a story uh, about real-time transient searching, which is slightly different than I imagine uh, what you've been getting in the past week. So future concerns for high-performance computing. Uh, power is one. Okay, It takes a lot of energy to power a large supercomputing facility. Uh, the nurse facility, which is sort of average in size, uh, um, uh, consumes 9 megawatts of power. Okay, uh, And this is real dollars that you have to pay uh, for this. Uh, the next thing uh, you have to think about is data. And you guys have been getting examples all week uh, from simulations. Now you can also see data sets that are going to be produced uh, by LSST. You name it data is increasing tremendously and it's not cheap and nor is it being tackled in a way like computing is with Moore's Law or anything else like that. Uh, programming. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about GPUs and some trends there. Uh, that is uh, different and you've, you've got to learn it. And so how do, you, how do you go about this? And all of these things hit your wallet one way or the other. And you've got to balance these. You can't get everything. That's never the way it works when you go propose to the government for something. So you've got to figure out what's the best blend for solving your problem. And for data intensive work like we're discussing here, sometimes the answers are very different than for other branches of computational science. So uh, this is a nice graph produced by the people at NURSE um, about sort of the, the future of uh, uh, where we're going. Uh, in, in computing. And so people are doing a real big push to get up to what they call the exascalator. Okay? Uh, here's uh, where we are right now. And, you know, this is the trend we'd like to maintain. The problem is, is that we could get there right now. It wouldn't, wouldn't be that much of a problem. It would cost a ton of money. Uh, but the power consumption for a machine right here, cranking out an exaflop, would be about 100 megawatts. And the government said, nope, you've got to build a machine that only consumes 20 megawatts. Okay. So that's, that is a challenge. Okay, so this is sort of the programming regime we've been, been living in for a while now. Uh, you just take your regular commodity uh, processors, chomp them together, and you run MPI. Um, we're now moving into a regime where most cutting edge codes use both Open MPI, uh, excuse me, Open MP and MPI. Uh, and that's sort of where we're working. Uh, but in the future, you know, you, you may have to tag on some GPUs and you'd be programming in OpenCL, CUDA, you name it, some new language. Uh, and, and who knows where we're going to be at at the exascale. Um, and, and what we're going to be taking advantage of. And so this is a real transitional period, and if you notice, uh, we're there right now. Okay? And so the question is, you have all of these wonderful codes that have been chomping away for years, and people have made the effort to, say, make them uh, parallel with both MPI and OpenMP, but now you have to make the jump to, say, using GPUs. Okay? Well, we can build the machine and put it out there and throw GPUs on it. And Oak Ridge is, is doing this right now. Okay? The problem is, is that the codes have to run on it. And that's not cheap to go through a million lines of code and figure out where to throw the parts of it that can be solved on the GPUs efficiently. So this is a huge, huge problem. And so the question is, when do you make this transition? When do you start opening up these machines? When do you start letting people play with them? Um, so, we started tackling some questions of what part of the nurse workload would benefit 
uh, from GPU acceleration. And, and conversely, you want to say, what would see no benefit whatsoever? Um, so we just have to answer the question at the end of the day, is this going to be beneficial to everybody, some fraction of people? Do we want to have two different machines in the future, et cetera? Uh, and then, you know, is even this the right way to the future? Is, is this a viable path that's going to be useful? For many things it is, because the power consumption for GPUs for the processing is, is a lot, lot cheaper. So we did a test bed system uh, called Jurek. It was uh, 44 nodes with one GPU per node. And it was put on the Carver cluster. Carver is an IBM iDataplex machine. And I'm going to talk about it a little bit later. It's what we use to process our data from the Palomar Transient Factory. Uh, these are the specs on the machine. Uh, and they put uh, CUDA on there. Uh, and they basically opened this up to people who were willing to, you know, take the dive in the deep end, okay? And so this is, this is what you're left with. Um, if, you, if you look, going to GPUs versus CPUs, okay, these are the things that you have to tackle. And it's the parallelism and the programmability, how easy it is to do this. And Tomas tells me he's going to have you guys programming, you know, on GPUs later this week. So we'll see how that goes. Um, but here's the problem for data. And so this is a really interesting, hard problem. And it's not trivial. Uh, and it comes down to basically the cost of data. Okay? GPUs and data do not mix too well. Okay? Um, and if you look at the cost of, of moving um, some data today, one millimeter, you're running at about six picojoules, okay? 20 millimeters, 100 picojoules. And by the way, that's not going to change between now and the time they want to start thinking about deploying these first exascale machines. Now, notice the flop costs. Today, it's about 100 picojoules, okay? But if you use something like GPUs and you push towards where you have to be with exascale, which is a maximum of 20 megawatts, then the cost will be 25 picojoules in 2018. Notice, though, this is what it's like moving it from memory down to your GPU or whatever. This is going to dominate the cost of your calculations, OK? Because that's electricity. That's real dollars, OK? So no matter what, trying to shove data onto these things is actually going to cost more than doing the flop and doing your calculation. Something to think about. Uh, so we ran a few different things here, everything from Lattice QCD to uh, an AMR code. Uh, and they did show some nice speed ups across the board taking advantage of the GPUs. Uh, and they had to work really hard in embedding the scientists in CS groups to describe their problem and, wor and work out, okay, what's the way that I can take advantage of this? Uh, and here were some comments. Um, you know, for the people writing the code, domain scientist input is essential. Because sometimes they threw out the way they were solving a problem to better take advantage of the G GPUs. They rewrote it from scratch, okay, and that was useful. Uh, programming on the GPU can be a bit challenging. Um, you know, it's programming books are made for programmers. They're not made for scientists, okay? So that's one thing. Um, some good compliments for advanced programming. CUDA uh, worked out nicely, although I have a bunch of people that are in the OpenCL camp in my group. Uh, and a lot of people said the challenge at the end of the day, comes out in using all the cores effectively, OK? You can get some examples. You can work them out. If you're doing an FFT or something, there's some really good libraries available. But at the end of the day, it's how do I balance what I'm throwing on the GPUs, what I'm doing on the cores? Um, not everyone was happy. Uh, they were disappointed in some of the uh, solver, your solvers they had. They thought the speed up they got wasn't worth reprogramming everything, OK? And another major issue 
was that CUDA was not trivial for data parallelism, okay? In addition to which, this is still bleeding edge. So even NVIDIA's idea of what works and what the performance is like was not up to date. And these are the two astrophysics codes uh, they tackled. Uh, Gamer, uh, which some of you may have heard of, uh, and, and another, an N-body code. Um, and, you know, it was okay. So this is one thing to think about in the future because GPUs are definitely going to be there. Um, they're cost effective for doing the flops, but for data, not so much. All right, so main part of the talk here is on the Palomar Transient Factory. So we have several current optical surveys that are running on the sky right now. Uh, PTF is one of them. Uh, there's also the La Silla Supernova sh Search on the ESO Schmidt. Uh, PanStars is, is running. SkyMapper is soon to be online. I talked with Brian Schmidt recently and he hopes that they're going to take off the camera and the cryo tigers in October and, and they'll be up and running uh, shortly thereafter after they fix some vibrational issues. Spectroscopic survey that's going on right now is uh, Sloan 3. Um, I'm part of the uh, Baryon Oscillation Spectroscopic Survey from that. And the thing about these surveys is, A, they're generating lots of data, and lots of data in unique ways. Uh, and they span astrophysics all across the board, from doing cosmology, doing searches for transients, um, looking at the local universe and, and asteroids. Uh, so it does cover everything, and that's part of the way these surveys are designed. You want to bring in the most people you can and mine all the possible science out of it. So PTF was challenged in an interesting way. Um, both Caltech and Berkeley approached the PanStars people about becoming members, uh, and then we were rejected. And so we were like, dang it, what are we going to do? And so we said, well, why don't we do something different which other people aren't doing? So PanStars, of course, wide field, multicolor survey. They're going to cover the whole three pi that they can see from Hawaii. So we said, let's just concentrate entirely on transients, OK? So we wanted to start real quickly. So we took the Palomar 48-inch telescope, which is not too far away from here. Uh, we took the CFH 12K camera, uh, which I'll show you in a bit. We said, forget the multiple colors. Um, we're not going to do that. We're going to look at exploring the time domain in really interesting ways. Everything from years to seconds. Okay? And then set up teams of scientists so that they could just mine this data as quickly as possible. And, and what we, in particular, our group was interested in was having the capability to provide immediate follow-up of unique transients, something that, that nobody's seen before, on four to 10 meter class telescopes where you get the spectroscopy. And this was sort of the view of the universe that we, we looked in, a plot of absolute magnitude in R versus the, the decay time, basically the time transient goes from peak brightness to 50% of its brightness, or conversely, the amount of time it takes to rise that much. And in green here, yellowish green, are the things that we've known about. The classical nova, the type 1a supernova, the core collapse supernova. And here were a whole bunch of things that people had proposed, but had not really had that many examples, or certainly weren't studied as a class. So we wanted to be able to mine all of this area. And you can see the decay time for some of these is 100 days to just a day. Okay, and it spans a range in absolute magnitude, which is, which is quite large, from things that you'll just see in the local universe to things that you can see out at a redshift of one. So, uh, this is the specs on the camera, which is going to be generating all the data. Uh, it's a 7.8 square degree field of view with one arc second pixels. We take 60 second exposures, and the reason we're doing that is you don't have to guide in 60 seconds. Uh, given the seeing that we have. So that's sort of about the maximum amount of time we can spend there, in addition to which there's about a 20-second readout or so. So that's nicely coupled. 
Uh, we started First Useful Science Images, came out uh, in 2009, and we end January 1st of this coming year. Uh, we started with two cadences. We did what we call a nightly cadence. We hit a piece of the sky twice, separated by an hour. Uh, the idea there is that asteroids will move during this time. We'll be able to spot them. Uh, and then we wanted to target things that were, say, in nearby clusters or in Andromeda so that we could probe the local universe on these shorter time scales. Then we did a program which we called the supernova cadence. This was done with the rest of the time, 65% of the time, which is every three nights. Uh, we've since modified that uh, down a little bit. Uh, the idea there is that these transients that take longer to rise not much is going to change on a time scale of three nights, and therefore we could do more square degrees and build up a larger sample. Uh, there's also an H-alpha survey done during bright time, and then when the weather gets bad at Palomar, which is in the November to February time frame, you can't maintain these nightly cadences or even the three-night cadences. It's very difficult. But the nights are incredibly long, so when they're good, they're great. And in fact, it's a weird thing about Palomar, is that if you pick any month of the year, the total observing time with clear weather is just about the same. So the summers, the weather is great, but you get six hours of observing. In the winter, the weather sucks, but you get these 12 hour long nights when the weather is, okay, so you've got to think about this. So what we decided to do there was minute cadence searches where you just sit on a field for four hours and you're just imaging it every minute and try to find really fast transients that way. So this is what the camera looks like. Uh, here's the full moon for size. We do have one dead chip, which sort of stinks for a lot of things, but uh, otherwise, sky is sky. We'll just take as much as we can get. Uh, it's 92 megapixels, so that means uh, data coming up is about 128 megabytes um, every minute. Okay. Now these were the science projects, and this was where PTF really did it. And this is the way you want to think about data in general. You, see, you heard talk this morning about publishing your data. Great thing about publishing your data, getting it out there, is that other scientists can use it for other things, things that you didn't even think of. Uh, Sloan, great example of this uh, with imaging data. God knows how many papers have been used now, uh, you know, hundreds, thousands. Okay, compared to the ratio Compare that to the ratio of the original Sloan collaboration, you know, it's an order of magnitude more of other people using that data. Same can be said as simulations. You publish that data, Millennium Simulation, you get it out there so people can use it. They'll do more great science with it. We wanted to set up these groups so that they were all set to mine the data. And you can see they span just about everything, uh, from supernova to AM CAN vans, AGN, blazars. We have LIGO people interested in gravitational waves, uh, neutrino transient uh, folks who call us up from IceCube and say, we just found something in this part of the sky, can you go image it? Uh, to uh, things like eclipsing stars, planet hunters, you name it. Okay, so the survey, I'll describe it to you so you guys understand the budgets for these things. Uh, the camera was a few hundred thousand dollars, roughly half a million, that type of work or maybe three quarters of a million. Upgrades to the facility were a few hundred thousand dollars, uh, mostly people time to tweak things up. Operational costs on a 48 inch, probably in the neighborhood of one to two hundred thousand dollars a year. Uh, we spent 1.5 million on the initial computing for this, and we probably spend about oh, 250,000 dollars a year, uh, mostly in people time to make sure that the pipeline keeps running and runs smoothly. That's sort of our cost there. It's the follow-up costs, though, that are incredibly expensive. We have large number of nights on all of these telescopes throughout the year to follow up the targets that we find with this survey. And these dwarf those other costs. They're almost a factor of two more than everything else put together. So the big thing is you don't want to screw up. Okay, and you want to maximize the efficiency of these instruments. And so that is what we aim to do with the surveys. Give people a clean, as unbiased as we possibly can, selection of objects that they can go and then use their follow-up time on. This is the way the pipeline's broken out, and this is always a good way when you're doing pipelines to make sure 
that everybody is accountable for their little piece and that they talk to each other very nicely and staying in communication is very good. Uh, in green, this is what we have happening on the mountain. Uh, we have a scheduler, uh, an observatory control system, the camera, and then a data quality monitor. And all those things go through running down there, keeping check on the data, making sure we're pointed where we're supposed to be pointed, making sure clouds haven't come in and the data is worthless, etc. And then they send it up and the data actually goes on a microwave relay um, from Palomar Mountain right down to here. And then from here, it trucks its way up and up to LBNL. Um, uh, we have two separate pipelines. One is what we call the detailed pipeline. It's run by IPAC. Uh, IPAC, you know, uh, basically very nice institute for storing data. Uh, even though it's NASA, they did things like 2MASS. They do the uh, detailed image processing uh, and work very, very hard to get the value out of every single photon that hits there and calibrated things well. I do the quick and dirty pipeline. Okay, I'm basically trying to do everything in real time. Okay, so when that data comes in, I'd like to be able to spit around and say there's a transient as soon as I can. Okay, so we process the data, we do image subtraction, we have a classifier, I'm going to talk about all of this, and then we spit it out to what we call the follow-up marshal, and this is basically, here's a list of targets. You can select now based upon what your science field is, the targets I want to follow up, and then you can go from there and send these out to consortium follow-up telescopes. We actually have one of the telescopes triggered automatically, the Palomar 60-inch telescope. If a candidate, even screened by the automatic classifier, which is just run on a computer, finds something really good and it's above a certain threshold, it will automatically trigger the Palomar 60-inch to swing around. So this is what it looks like up at NURSE. The data comes up from the observatory. We have special nodes at NURSE called data transfer nodes. Um, they can see all of the file systems at NURSE. We have a specific file system called the NURSE Global File System where we have purchased for the collaboration 250 terabytes of space. Um, we're up now to about 170 terabytes used by the Palomar Transient Factory. Uh, this data uh, is processed and um, subtracted on Carver. So we basically will take several images of a piece of sky, add them together, usually a median uh, co-edition, and that'll become our reference image. Then when a new image comes in on that part of the sky, we do a subtraction where you're doing a convolution, uh, astrometric matching, and then subtraction, and then we scan it with source extractor, we pull out the data, and we throw it into a database. And the database sits on the science gateway node. And then from here, uh, everything hits it to try to figure out what's good and what's not. Okay? And most of this stuff ain't good. Okay? So this comes out, and then we have uh, science gateway nodes, which allow you to see this data in various forms and query the database through a web interface. Uh, and that goes out to the rest of the PTF collaboration. So here's our database schema. Uh, like I said, you process the images. Those go into the, the metadata on those images goes into the database. You can then do simple queries like, do I have enough images to build a new reference? Yes, go ahead, build it. It'll build a new reference. The reference goes into the database. And you have a reference when a new image comes in. It can ask the question, is there a reference? I can do a subtraction. If so, run the subtraction. Then the subtraction gets scanned for candidates. Those candidates get loaded into the database. And then we do lots of interesting things, which I'll talk about with these queries. Uh, it is a simple Postgres SQL database. Uh, we use the, a program uh, called Q3C uh, to do our spatial indexing. It's pretty nice. Uh, at the time we started this up, MySQL was the only one that had HTM, which uh, Tomas talked about previously. Um, but, you know, Q3C worked pretty well for our needs. Uh, we have 1.8 million images uh, that we've processed so far. We've made about 32,000 references. Each of the references is about 0.7 square degrees on the sky. They basically occupy one of the chips out of the 11 working chips on the camera. 
Uh, we've processed 1.4 million subtractions. We have 900 million five sigma candidates in the database. Um, 45,000 saved transients. Uh, that means uh, objects that somebody thought was interesting and decided to give it a name. Okay. Uh, and this has been accomplished in the 800 nights that have been clear. Uh, this is our sky coverage. Uh, you can say we stick away from the galaxy here, and of course we can't observe below a deck of about minus 30. Uh, we've spectroscopically confirmed it's almost 1,600 uh, supernova um, uh, on the order of 100,000 new galactic transients uh, and tens of thousands of transients in Andromeda. And you can see the number of images that we've taken here is, uh, oh, a good chunk of the sky, it's a few hundred. Uh, and in each of those points, we actually go to about a magnitude of 24 uh, when you co-add all the data. So it's quite deep. Um, in this part of the sky right here, uh, you can see that's, uh, uh, M let's see, get my coordinates right, M31, which we sit on every night when it's up. Okay, so we produce about one million candidates during a typical night. Most of this is not real. There are image artifacts, misalignment of image due to poor sky conditions, uh, image saturation from bright stars, cosmic rays, you name it. Every night we find about 50,000 asteroids, a um, couple thousand variable stars, a hundred supernova, okay, most of these are supernova that we already know, uh, but about three to four new young supernova or other explosive transients. And this is what we're after, okay? So, it's the one in a million type of thing, and how do you, how do you find it? So, this is a typical uh, run of what a subtraction looks like, and I'll post this talk online, you guys will be able to see this better. Uh, reference image, the new image, and the subtraction. I'm going to hone in on this galaxy a little bit. Um, we get about 3,000 of these a night, on a good clear night. And if you look over here, you can see all these smudges, and you can see they're correlated with these stars here. This is actually a very clean subtraction, but I'll show you some of the problems. So, here's a galaxy, nice known nearby galaxy, okay? Here's the supernova. No chance you'd see that just by blinking the images or whatever. Um, this was PTF-10YGU. It was caught a couple days after explosion, sent to the Hubble Space Telescope four days uh, after we detected it for the first observation in the ultraviolet with the STIS camera. Here are some of the other things on there. Uh, so this is a star that's just sort of saturated and it picks up this, but not only that, on another star which is close to saturation it picks up little things on the edge. This was a very, very clean subtraction. There were only 230 bogus candidates like these on there. There were two variable stars, four asteroids, and at the time what we thought was the earliest type 1a supernova that we ever caught where it was just a, a day or so uh, after explosion. Um, but it wasn't. The following year, uh, we found this last August, um, PTF 11KLY in M101, which was caught only 11 hours after explosion. Now, I'm going to tell you a story about this one, just so that you understand that machines often aren't the best things in the world, and many bad things happen. Uh, yet, if if you work hard, you can often overcome these problems. So we were doing a G-band run that night, and uh, we only had hit about 500 square degrees twice during the night. The rest went to new reference images. Um, there was a 50-50 split between this nightly cadence and the supernova cadence, and M101 is one of the galaxies that we hit every night when it's up. Now, the interesting thing was the, the Palomar 48-inch scheduler, which I talked about. That's run and maintained by a guy named Iran Ofek, who was a postdoctoral fellow there. He had just gotten a job in Israel. Uh, and this was in June. He was getting ready to fly out. And he said, Peter, can I let the schedule just keep on going with what we're doing until I get settled down in Israel in a few months? And I said, Iran, sure, no problem, you know. 
And this went on, and then it was August, and I pinged him, and I said, Iran, have you updated the schedule? He's like, not quite yet. I'll get to it next week. M101 was already way below where we normally follow an object. We try to hit it between an air mass of two and better. This was already down at about three at the start of the night. Matter of fact, most amateur astronomers stop following it when it gets that low. Okay? So this was an object that we shouldn't have been following. Okay? But Iran screwed up the schedule. Unfortunately, we found it. Um, there were 10 new transients found that night. Uh, the pipeline was slow, uh, very slow. It was running six hours behind normal due to the fact that somebody at the supercomputing center thought, oh, it'd be really nice to update all the kernels on Carver, and yet failed to tell anybody, and poof, all my code broke. Okay? Uh, in addition to which, it got even worse than that, as I told you, we have this automatic robot that goes through and saves things, okay, if it reaches a certain threshold. This supernova absolutely met that threshold, and it should have been automatically saved. The problem was, just coincidentally, that same night that people screwed things up at Nurse for Me, a system administrator at Caltech switched the IP address of a machine that we used all the time to do the saving, because they saved the data down there. That's where the follow-up is handled. Uh, so you had to save them by hand, okay? The robot couldn't do it. So Josh Bloom and I are sitting there at lunch. He's in his office on campus. I'm in my office down at Nurse, munching away on our lunch and saving candidates by hand, uh, something which Yano Shear has done many times, but this is not the way you're supposed to do a survey. So Josh went through and found this wonderfully beautiful supernova right off a, an elliptical galaxy. And I said, wait, I can do better than that. And I went into the database and I said, give me the best candidate that was observed last night in a known nearby galaxy. And boom, this was it. This is what the subtraction. So just after he sent me this, it's like I got to do something better than him. So here's my query. Boom, got it. And we found this nice supernova in M101. It was actually so bright that we could query the database and found out that it had increased 20% in brightness in the two images separated by just over 45 minutes that we had taken. Uh, it was screaming up. And we caught it one one thousandth of the brightness that it reached at peak. It got to just uh, brighter than 10th magnitude, 9.9. .9. So then a question comes, okay, what do you do for follow-up? Okay? Now, this should have been scheduled during the night. Things should have happened automatically. But, you know, here's a messaging service. And Mark Sullivan was over in England just getting ready to uh, uh, head home. And he asked the question, do you think it's real? And I said, yes. I wasn't really convinced it was a Type 1A supernova, which is the project I had. I thought this was going to go to Avishai Galyam, be a nice nearby core collapse supernova. And the great thing was he robotically scheduled the Liverpool telescope to swing over and take a spectrum of this. And then once we figured out it was a supernova, everything started getting triggering that we could get in contact with. And three hours after our discovery, we were able to publish a spectroscopically confirmed Type 1A supernova was found in M101. Now this is what Josh and I were doing. This is sort of the user interface. You give uh, the database, a query through the science gateway nodes. I have a candidate, here's its ID, and then you get back the new, the reference, and the sub, and you can save it, and then it goes off into the, the marshal where you can add follow-up data. What was not running that night was Josh's robot, which automatically goes through and scans this, and then hits a bunch of other databases. Our database is one thing. Our database will have a history on the sky in that portion, but it's so much more powerful if you couple it with, say, Sloan. And say Sloan has a spectroscopic redshift for the galaxy, and then you can add that information in. And now you're not dealing with apparent magnitudes and changes in apparent magnitudes, but now you're dealing with absolute magnitudes, which starts to give you a hold on what type of object this is. So that context is very, very important. In addition to which, we can start taking that context and we can couple it with many other things. And, and Josh has done this with machine learning classification. And what you can do then is say, take the history of the variability of the object, and then 
do a machine learning classifier, which then compares it to a whole bunch of other objects that have been put in. Uh, and here is just the star portion of our, our robot that goes through, classifying everything from our lyres and, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, let's see, we have Cepheids in here. Um, there are eclipsing binaries, you name it. It goes through and tries to match up with that, and then comes back with a probabilistic statement. Oh, you know, most likely it is this or this, and then it can actually even tell you, and if you take your next data point here at such and such a depth, that'll help you best classify this object. Now, this is a really new area in, in stats, okay? And more than anything else, it's, it's stats that we're dealing with. Statisticians have been doing machine learning classifying for a long time, but they do it on things like the stock market. What's great about the stock market? Stock market gives you a value on a price of stock, you know, every minute, let's say, or every second. And that value is right, okay? What's different with us? Well, there's no regular cadence. We're on when we're on, we're on when the scheduler says we're on, and not only that, we're on when the scheduler says we're on and the dome's open because the weather's good, okay? I don't come in with a value, say, on brightness. I come in with a value and an uncertainty, okay? Sometimes that data point may even be wrong. If variable star I'm looking at gets hit with a cosmic ray, all of a sudden its brightness can go up tremendously, okay? So these are all the things that this type of machine learning classifier has to deal with. And then, of course, this is just for variable stars. We have active galaxies, we have supernova, you name it. Another thing we did was uh, what we call galaxy, you saw Galaxy Zoo, uh, that, that photographed galaxy. We did supernova Galaxy Zoo, where we basically asked four questions of the citizen scientists with their ref, new, and subtraction to basically state, does this look like a good subtraction? Is the candidate there more or less circular? Um, did things subtract well off on the side? Um, they could handle about 200 objects a night, and they'd classify those in a few hours. Uh, and then we'd rank them, and the top-ordered ones would be looked at by somebody in our class. Uh, collaboration, and then they would schedule those for follow-up. It was a great way to go through data when we didn't have our machine learning classifiers up to speed. They classified a lot of objects for us, over um, 50,000 total. Uh, and so then we used that, and we looked at the mean human zoo score, and the scoring is arbitrary here, but threes means it's a perfect, beautiful supernova. Uh, and then we did something which we called the machine learned zoo score. So we took all of their data and then trained a machine learning classifier on that. And so what we have here, and once again, heading up towards uh, a half here is supreme score. So confirmed transients are in red. Uh, transients which, uh, and these are spectroscopically confirmed. Blue are transients that we confirmed photometrically. A lot of them will be variable stars, so they shouldn't rate that high. Uh, and then we have a mess of things which uh, were never followed up for whatever reason. Uh, and you can see that there was some correlation here, but this is the better way of looking at it. Uh, this is called an ROC curve. Um, so basically, what are the two things you're interested in? You don't want to miss anything, and you don't want to tell somebody something's good when it's really bad. So it's your false positive rate, okay, versus your missed detection rate. And so perfect is heading over here. You haven't missed a single thing, and you haven't given anybody a bad object to look at. So you're always trying to optimize in this direction. And this is what the human zoo did, and this is what our machine learned zoo did based upon their classifications. And you say, why shouldn't they be the same? Okay, well, citizen scientists. Uh, we have 200 objects. Once they get classified 20 times, you're basically, we call that done. We say nobody else needs to scan. Okay, so the data can come out to them basically anywhere between, oh, British time, let's say, uh, between midnight and noon. That's, that's when they're getting this data. You get a lot of random people that 
hop in at, say, 3 a.m. to classify supernova for you. And their ability drops, OK? Who knows? They've had a few pints at the pub. They come in, oh, yeah, I want to find a few supernova. OK, we've noticed this, by the way. When the pubs get out two hours later, classification is usually at its lowest point, OK? 12 noon, people on a lunch break, they go, they've had a few cups of coffee, usually very good, OK? Uh, that's what's happening here. What the machine learning zoo could go through and say is, ah, we not only look at the classification of this, but we could actually look at how well this person did their job in the past. And so we could improve upon this by ranking the zooites uh, in, in a very nice way. So uh, machine learning zoo, we also have something we call real bogus. These are both these machine learning programs. So uh, here is um, real bogus, and here are the number of type 1a supernova up as soon as I did this in January, I guess. Um, and so this is our cut. This is the cut we use. Uh, it's about 0.07 on this score. Um, and so 5% of real five sigma detections that go into our database basically fall below the threshold for what we call is good, okay? Now, uh, that's not too bad. If we require two detections uh, that have, um, uh, you know, one of their values above this, uh, then we're down to 0.1% that fail to get included, okay? We can look at that in a different way. Um, we can look at um, right here, detections in red, this are the total number of detections, okay? And I stopped at a thousand percent increase. So this is a thousand percent, this is percent increase here versus uh, the number of supernova type 1a detections. Now, percent increase, why is this a useful number? Um, you have a supernova on a dinky little LMC-like galaxy, you're going to find it every single time because it's going to have a thousand percent increase because type 1a supernova are about an absolute magnitude of minus 19. You have a supernova sitting on top of a massive elliptical galaxy, which is at a redshift of 0.05. That supernova is barely going to get a few percent, even though it may be brighter than the one that's in the LMC, observationally, uh, its contrast is very, very low. So this is something that we're always interested in, is what is our bias? In using this. So if we look at the blue, this is where we trigger. This is, this is what uh, gets us above that real bogus threshold of, of 0.07 that we had in there. Um, so you can see we're missing out down here. Um, and at 25% increase, uh, we're about 68% uh, complete. But we're only 50% complete down here at a 10% increase. Now, if we turn that around and we say, OK, let's cut it to everything that's a magnitude below our, our nominal survey depth. So our nominal survey depth is 20th magnitude. We get that in 60 seconds during full moon. Get to about 21st magnitude um, in new moon. So if we cut this down to 19th magnitude, a factor of 2.5 and flux above that, you can see that we are very complete uh, at all levels. So what our survey can say basically at the end of the day is that we're, we're complete to 19th magnitude. Now, turnaround. Okay. When we started this survey, all I promised the collaboration was that I would have transients in the database ordered, classified in 24 hours. Okay. So that when you got on the sky the next night, you could follow these up. What we've pushed through is doing this as quickly as possible. So um, this is just a random night. This is from uh, June of last year. This is the time from observation to the candidate being in the database. Uh, and as you see, we have a median of around 30 minutes. Okay. Uh, what does this allow you to do? This allows you to do a bunch of amazing physics. Um, here is a, a detection of a supernova 10 VDL. So we have two observations separated by an hour. Um, 
this went into the database one hour later. Oracle is what Josh calls it. I think it's something like, uh, if you're up the creek without an or, call Cal. Okay, I don't know. You know, so it says 1-800-CAL number. Um, people over in Israel, by the way, doing transient searches, it's really good to have people on all sides of the planet at any one time because somebody's always up when you're taking data. Okay? So uh, the folks at Weizmann in Israel actually triggered uh, a telescope in the um, uh, Negev Desert, uh, and so they got an image of it. Uh, they triggered Gemini, which came around a few hours later uh, and was able to get a spectrum of it. Triggered Swift at the same time. They were able to get it on about the same time we got the Gemini trigger. Once we confirmed what it was, we were able to trigger a radio telescope. Okay, and all of this occurred in, in less than 36 hours, okay? And it was an incredibly young core collapse supernova, very low luminosity, only absolute magnitude minus 14, which we caught literally uh, within hours of its explosion. Okay, so this is what our transient neighborhood looks like. Uh, I study the type 1As. We find the majority of type 1As because they're the brightest and most common, so there's a good one to choose as opposed to people who are interested in 1BCs. Um, and now if you look at our diagram of characteristic time scale versus peak luminosity, and now in gray are the ones we've known about. Yes, we've discovered you know, well over a thousand of these objects, but now we've started to fill in this gap here. We've broken the classical NOVA relationship by finding objects which have time scales which are very short and their luminosity is lower. We found scores of luminous supernova. Uh, paper by Robert Quimby uh, broke open this field. Uh, we have found what we think are 0.1a explosions. Okay, These are type 1a supernova that uh, rise in a tenth of the time and there's a tenth as bright. So they call them point one A's. Uh, we found a bunch of luminous red novae, uh, and then a whole smattering of what we call calcium-rich transients, which we have no idea what they are. Okay. So where are we headed? Okay. Well, you do PTF. You think about PTF two. What could you do that would be better, and different? Um, we'd like to upgrade the field of view to fill out the entire Schmidt field of view, which is 36 square degrees. Uh, you guys ever get the chance to go take a look at the old Schmidt plates? We're actually trying to fill that up with silicon now. Okay, so that would be a billion pixels. Okay, we'd like to explore the sky on the time scale of 100 seconds. So take a 60 second image, take another 60 second image, and actually look at the differences between those images and say, what's happening here that's unique and unknown? Uh, turn around in 10 to 20 minutes with a new list of candidates, and we would like to have spinning. Okay, so right now in our database, one of the queries we did, I told you about it before, is I asked for the best candidate in a known nearby galaxy. Okay, well, what is known in nearby? Well, we decided to ingest a list of all the galaxies that have spectroscopic redshifts to them that are less than 200 megaparsecs away. Okay, And so that's about 300,000 objects. That sits in our database. Every time a new candidate comes into the database, we query against that and say, ah, it's within, say, two uh, um, uh, radii of this galaxy. It's nominally associated with this galaxy. And we put that out there as added value. What we'd like to do is ingest the entire Sloan coverage, say maybe NED, maybe all of uh, the Sloan 3 data from BOSS, you name it, basically everything to further refine these objects. If we find a transient on a redshift 0.7 galaxy in such a shallow survey, that's interesting because that guy is incredibly bright. If we find it at a redshift of 0.15, that's not so interesting. It's probably a type 1a supernova near peak brightness, and we're not going to want to waste any follow-up time. Being able to answer that question immediately 
is highly useful because then you can trigger telescopes in real time without consulting a human to look at the data and go through and do this, which is what we're doing now. They're building a new spectrograph that's going to go on the Palomar 60 inch called the SED machine, which is going to take R of 100 spectra to just basically crudely classify these objects. We'll basically have 20 triggers a night. We would like to use this on the most valuable things without any human interaction whatsoever. In addition to which, we want to be able to handle triggers from LIGO, their neutrino detectors, advanced LIGO. Um, and this is something where they'll come up with a gravitational wave signal and they'll basically tell us we know its location to 100 square degrees. That's it. Okay? So we've got to go up there and plaster the sky with images. Okay? Take about three or four of these with the new telescope. Come back again, do it again, and then try to go through and say what makes sense for a transient. Because in 100 square degrees, we're actually going to find a lot of transients every single night. Which one is most likely to be associated with an advanced LIGO trigger? So these are some of the data issues that we have right now. So uh, coming off of the mountain on this microwave relay, we get about 2.5 megabytes per second. As I told you, each of the uh, raw images is 128 megabytes. This matches nicely. Uh, it's going to be a problem in the future. If we increase the camera size by a factor of five, we've got to do something about this bandwidth. Um, we get about one gigabyte per second um, coming off of the NURSE uh, global file system to the science gateway nodes. Okay, um, okay. That's, that's not bad. It's, it's not great though. If you think about these images, they're going to be a gigabyte. Uh, the reference images are going to be a gigabyte. Uh, and the subtractions are going to be a gigabyte. And then we've got to run processing on these as well. It's very I.O. limited. We make a whole bunch of other images that come off of this as well. Bad pixel maps, you name it. Um, so this is starting to going to be pushed. Uh, once you do the subtractions and the scanning, it's not much data there, and so we're well above this. And getting the stuff out, the reduced amount of data, that's never going to be a problem. But this is going to be the, the real problem. Okay? We want to trigger on something, we want to trigger on something without any human interaction. So in red, let's say we have the light curve of some transient, okay? And this is what I call, insulting all you people that want to study variable stars, a boring transient. It's some variable that goes up and down like this, okay? And these are detections. In fact, here, these are, these are upper limits, uh, basically, on the survey depth. And notice that this goes up and down. And this happens every month, okay? It's dark skies, you go deeper. Moon comes up, bright skies, you don't go as deep, okay? And so your ability to search for transients varies, okay? Clouds come in, things change. Okay, but we get to here and all of a sudden our detection threshold is way, way below where our transient's sitting and boom, we've now found this guy, okay? And, and we have this data here, these two points, and we say, oh, look at this, okay? We're seeing something on the rise, and as far as our database knows, there's nothing been there before, okay? Now, it's a well-known thing in observational astronomy that the most objects you find are at the limit of your survey depth, okay? Think about it, it's not too, not too surprising. What we don't want to do is hit this one with the follow-up spectrum. This is a boring transient, okay? Because we could hit this at any point. Okay, and get a spectrum of it. It's not new. What we would like to be able to do is go back and ask the database, if I co-add all of this data together, I would be able to get down to about here, and then I'd see this transient. So can we not only trigger something like the SED machine to take a spectrum, but can we trigger our database to say, build a new co-addition, run a subtraction, and figure out, was this guy there before, but you know, at two sigma in any one of our individual images, not five sigma, okay? This is, that's a really challenging question to go through. One of the ways we've thought about doing it, I don't know if this is really plausible given all the image size, I think it's something that they are thinking about with LSST, 
is you set up a database like SciDB and you actually put the image data into the database. So the pixels sit in the database. Then you could imagine doing a query in which the query actually builds at a particular location a deeper reference image where you've co-added the data from, say, a week's worth of time. Be one possibility, okay? Um, let's see here. Just about done. Okay, so tomorrow I'm going to talk about a couple of things with the databases and how we use them and some new uh, parallel databases uh, that we're exploring. Um, some of the things that we've done here, uh, this was a couple of years back, um, one of our first things that led to, okay, where, where could we go in the future if we wanted to put this on, is, is looking at um, the Dash machine where we had these SSDs, which our database sat on, which are basically, I'd think of it as an order of magnitude faster than spinning disk, an order of magnitude slower than memory, and we had some really good speed ups for just this type of question that I was asking, which is doing a, a forward search and a backward search in the database. So if you find a new object, that candidate goes in, the first question you ask is this spatial query, which is give me all the transients that have occurred on this portion of the sky, okay, at this location in the past. Um, that's one query. The other query we do, which is somebody saves a new object and you want to go in and ask that same type of, of question. You want to build up a light curve and you also want to build up the non-detection. So it's not only a question of I want to know every single value that this object has had, but I also want to know the upper limits. And so it's a slightly different question. Uh, it's a challenging one. In addition, when you couple that with your local universe catalog, uh, these take quite a bit of time. And so we saw speed ups here <coughs> of 25 to over 100 because these random, heavy random IO queries are, are ideal for, for these types of machines. Uh, another thing we're looking at is um, a product put out by uh, Aster. Uh, it's now owned by Teradata. Uh, and it's a parallel database. And I'm going to take you guys through this tomorrow. Um, it is an interesting type of thing because um, what they specialize in is taking these user-defined queries, say user-defined queries that involve Java or Python or R, and figuring out the best way to parallelize that as well. Okay, So that when you ask your query, it can learn and say, oh, you know what? I need to split this table up across all the processors and run the query that way because that'll be the fastest way to do it. Or I'm going to replicate this table across all the processors and then have the processors work on one-on-one -on -one, because that'll be the fast query. It actually trains itself to learn how best to do that. Okay, so LSST. Okay, so we're talking about a 48-inch telescope right now. And we're following it up with basically every single telescope on the face of the planet that we can get a hold of. You saw triggers there on SWIFT, HST, Keck, you name it. Okay. Um, LSST is quite a bit more data. Okay. And at that time, there's only going to be one 30-meter telescope. Okay. You have a 10-ish meter telescope finding transients. You need a 30-meter telescope to get spectra of them. Okay. So you can do two things. You can say, I'm going to throw out all of that type of data. I'm not going to bother going after it. I'm just going to take what I get from LSST alone. It's its own self-contained project, and that's it. Or you can say, I'm going to get really, really good with what I'm doing with projects like PTF right now so that I can figure out how when an object blows up at 25th magnitude, 24th magnitude, and I'm going to waste that three hours at Keck or that 20 minutes on the 30 meter telescope to get the spectrum because I know this is really interesting with all the other data that I have around it, going through and doing historical queries, etc. This is not something the LSST project is planning for, but it is something that many in the transient field are interested in. 
And so now sort of about the time that we need to think because this is going to take several years to figure out the best way to do it. And that's it. I'll leave you there. Take any questions. Thanks. Yeah, so that, that's something we talk a lot about at, at NURSE. And so I think that baby step would be a heck of a lot nicer. What would be even nicer is all the major mathematical libraries, they do that for you under the hood so that you never have to worry about doing that. I mean, how many of us who even program truly know what the compiler is doing, okay? Um, so that would be best. Um, I've seen some of these. Once again, the question comes down to uh, how much can you get out of them and is what you get out of them with these steps like going to the uh, ACC worthwhile? You know, um, I think it's definitely worthwhile to try it out because there's not a huge investment by the programmer to learn how to do something like that. Okay. Um, that said, you know, I was in grad school when MPI became, you know, and so sat down and learned that. Before that, I had learned how to put Cray directives in um, and, and, and vectorize loops. This is something that we basically just have to face. The, the, I think more of the problems for me come with dealing with the data and how that's going to be handled. Because right now, the bandwidth from memory to the GPU is, is slow. And so that is, that's going to be more of the fundamental change that I'm more worried about. I think you're right that some of these other steps, they'll help ease the way for people to get into this. So. Anything else? I have you on time for lunch. That's always a good thing. <laughs> <laughs>